Coming up, a new official has been hired at the National Park Service to help repatriate indigenous human remains and cultural items. Plus, who is a tribal citizen? 300 Nooksack individuals are in dispute about this with the tribal government in Northwest Washington. I am Alia Chavez. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from the ICT newscast. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. Working with award-winning professors, Cronkite students learn news reporting, social media, shooting and editing videos, and producing content for communications industries. Cronkite's 15 professional programs give students the opportunity to cover critical issues throughout the U.S. and beyond. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Kuwatsi Hopa. Thank you for joining us. An oil spill last week in the Amazon region of Ecuador is leaving thousands of indigenous people without access to water and fishing. A rockfall ruptured a key oil pipeline, spilling 6,300 barrels into a natural reserve in a protected area of the Amazon. Indigenous groups and environmentalists say the oil has reached the Coca and Napo River. Estimates of the spill say it is affecting more than 27,000 people from 105 native communities. Alexandria Almeida, a member of an environmental group, says more about how the area was affected. This contaminated area is a protected area, which means that it is ecologically fragile and has a high biodiversity, which is why it has been designated as a protected area as a national park. So obviously, the damage in this area is much more significant because it is a protected area. OCP says more than 84 percent of the crude has been recovered. However, 226,000 square feet of the nature reserve has been polluted. In Oklahoma, a prominent indigenous artist has been charged with a felony. According to court documents, Walter Bunky Echohawk Jr. has been charged with lewd behavior with a child under 16 years old in Pawnee County. Indian Country Today found that a warrant of Echo Hawk's arrest was issued on January 10th, and he was booked into jail on January 14th. That same day, he was released after posting a $10,000 bond. Echo Hawk denies the allegations, according to court documents. The investigation into the allegations began in late 2021, according to a sworn statement from a law enforcement officer. The victim reported being improperly touched repeatedly over several years, starting at age seven. If convicted of the felony charge, Echo Hawk could serve time ranging from three to 20 years, according to the charging document. Minnesota is home to 10,000 lakes and just about as many artists. And people who are from the state who are used to the cold use any excuse to get outside. On Lake Harriet in Minneapolis, two indigenous groups joined the Art Shanty projects over the weekend. The, uh, the Winter Art Festival takes place over four weekends on the frozen lake in the Twin Cities. Dakota lacrosse players braved the ice with handmade sticks. And the Pretendians, which is a native rock band, played in a plexiglass box to keep them warm. The lake has historically been known by the Dakota people as Bidet Unma. The 2022 Sundance Film Festival was virtual and had seven satellite screening locations throughout the country. Indigenous voices and filmmakers were amplified throughout the festival programming this year. ICT correspondent Karina Dominguez has more on that, plus the only Indigenous-made film to win an award this year. Hi, hello, como esta? Ako po si Don Josephus Rafael Eblahan, ang director ng pelikula The Headhunter's Daughter. The 2022 Sundance Film Festival's inclusive programming highlights Indigenous voices and artists who are on the rise. The Headhunter's Daughter won the short film Grand Jury Prize. 
The film is about Lin, an aspiring country music singer from the Philippines who travels far away from home on horseback and arrives in the bustling concrete city up in the skies, where she enters an audition for a country music show. And in this film, we see her traverse the post-colonial world and see that through the eyes and perspective of an indigenous person in the Philippines. It was important for us to make this film with a community that we have in our hometown. Although made during the pandemic in a tight-knit crew of around six to eight people, we managed to make something very intimate and personal to us. Six indigenous-made films and three New Frontier exhibition pieces were showcased at the festival this year. At the Sundance Institute's Native Forum celebration, it was announced that Fox Maxi is this year's Mirata Mita Fellowship winner. I want to say that I'm very excited for the future. I'm very grateful for all the people that I met along the way. The young filmmaker says it's a blessing that she can create what she wants without limitations. Karina Dominguez, reporting for ICT. And those are the headlines for the ICT newscast. Coming up, issues of sovereignty, ancestral rights, and the law. Stay with us. The Hallmark Law, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, requires museums and federal agencies to identify Native human remains and other objects of cultural significance, then return them to the tribal nations to which they belong. In the 31 years since the act was created, there has never been a full-time NAGPRA investigator until now. David Barland Lyles was hired by the National Park Service last week for the role, and he joins us now. Hi, David. Thanks for having me on. So I understand that you've been doing this for so many years now. Tell us about your history in NAGPRA investigations. Yes, uh, prior to becoming the nation's first full-time uh, NAGPRA investigator, I was a law enforcement officer for the National Park Service in a couple of capacities. Uh, I did 25 years of law enforcement for that agency and I was the uh, a park ranger, I was a special agent and um, also a law enforcement program manager. And in those roles, I was investigating many types of crimes but built a specialty in cultural resource crime and um, investigated crimes that were directly related to NAGPRA in the national park system including uh, an investigation at Effigy Mounts National Monument, which was involved the theft of indigenous human remains to circumvent the provisions of that law. As time went on, the National NAGPRA program began to rely on me to do investigations on a part-time basis so that I could do civil penalties investigations across the country. So I understand it's been um, a few weeks now since you've officially stepped into this role. What are some of the examples of repatriation projects that you're currently working on? Some that I've done in the past, you know, I can't talk about active investigations I'm doing right now, but some of the investigations I've done in the past include um, allegations that have come in through, say, the Mashpee Wampanoag, who was attempting to have a museum repatriate um, Mashpee, excuse me, Massasoit Aits Mequon, who was the um, Sachet who signed the 1621 ag agreement or treaty with the pilgrims. And he and everybody that was buried in the burial location was excavated by a museum in Rhode Island. And um, had, they had never repatriated it. So I did that investigation, which revealed that they were subject to the provisions of the law because they have accepted federal funds. And indeed, that led to the repatriation of Massasoit, H. Sinequan, and all other 41 people that were in that cemetery. 
This idea of repatriation is one that a lot of tribes really deal with carefully. It's um, something that's very linked to um, our ancestors and to um, you know many lineages um, in indigenous communities. Given that you're a non-native person, how do you sort of interpret the um, importance of being able to repatriate native human remains? Oh, <laughs> excellent question. <laughs> and, uh, you know, very layered um, in my approach to it. One is the law is designed to restore or help restore um, indigenous human rights to indigenous nations. So um, as a non-native person, I find that it's just a humbling responsibility to assist with the restoration of those indigenous human and civil rights. So many tribal partners that I work with, as I do these repatriation investigations have let me know that sometimes their people would be harmed if they were doing these types of investigations. So it's very helpful for somebody who is not indigenous to step in on their behalf because um, I won't be harmed by these investigations. And in fact, all I will be is, is empowered by them while I return power to indigenous nations. David, I'm very curious, what are some of the ways that you think NAGPRA can be improved? Well, right now, actually, the National NAGPRA program is proposing changes to the Code of Federal Regulations associated with the statute. And some of those improvements especially seem to be around helping museums better make affiliation determinations to modern day tribes based on geographical location of where those, those ancestors and things were removed from. So that would make a huge difference. And what are some of your personal goals in this role? Well, you know, the program had never had a investigative bureau. So I intend to bring a professionalism to the investigative bureau and hope that my focus and attention and professionalism will increase the amount of repatriations and assist sovereign nations with having the respectful return of their people and, and their sacred objects and items of cultural patrimony. David, I have just one last question, and that is, um, if you think that this NAGPRA investigation team will ever expand, you're one person uh, looking at NAGPRA investigations all over the country, but uh, uh, looking down the line, is this something that you think more people should be invested in on an official capacity? Well, yes, it's true. I am an investigative bureau of one, but I won't be shy about ensuring that I don't disappoint anybody. And if the, say, caseload gets high enough that um, I need assistance, I will be asking for it. And I'm happy to lead a team of investigators. Well, David, thank you for your time. Thank you. Instead of getting ready for Christmas, several individuals faced eviction notices. Why? The Nooksack tribe has disenrolled 306 tribal citizens based on historic records. 63 live in housing owned by the tribe. It is traced back to one individual who was enrolled decades ago, but isn't listed on the tribe's 1942 census. Those on the chopping block have turned to the United Nations for help. To help us understand this complex issue is John Tasuda III. He's the former senior counselor to the Secretary of the Interior and Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs. Hi, John. Thanks for being here. Hi, Leah. Thanks for having me again. So how are you breaking down this entire Nooksack situation? Um, it's very complicated. Uh, and in full disclosure, you know, this issue was going on while I was at the department. Um, it's very complicated. And so, uh, and, you know, it, it's also uh, difficult to deal with because we oftentimes in a good way try to infuse uh, policy and law with cultural elements, you know, to make them uh, good for a community. In this case, you know, we have cultural elements, you know, that, that are affecting the policy. Um, 
but in a bad way this time. So, you know, it, it's, uh, these are very difficult. It's obviously hard for folks, uh, you know, uh, you know, on different sides of the issue. So, um, you know, they're, they're, they're complicated. As I said before, the United Nations has now stepped in, which is something super rare to happen. How do you make sense of, um, you know, the United Nations actually making a statement on this situation? Well, you know, again, they, you know, the, as we know, they don't really have any legal standing here uh, for, you know, the federal government and its interaction with the tribes. Um, but, you know, if you would sort of analogize it to the court of public opinion, obviously, um, you know, they bring a lot of attention with that. And uh, one of the one of the challenges, though, when you know when you bring UN into discussions on uh, United States Native policies, is that the UN often takes uh, not a tribal focused, uh, but more of a people focused approach. That is, they try to protect peoples. And, and if you look internationally, there there aren't that many countries that have the protections for tribal governments, you know, that, that we have in the United States. And so that is something that, you know, oftentimes the UN people uh, are approaching things from a different direction. And when I talked about policy and culture, you know, that's one thing. They're, they're sort of weighing in on the culture side of it. Um, and again, that brings a lot of attention to it. And they certainly point out, uh, you know, facts that would be uh, great for consideration by, by policymakers. But they don't really have any standing on the policy front. And, and that's where the most difficult decisions are. Some of the facts that the UN highlighted was that these Nooksack people could have been evicted over the holidays. There had been flooding, and of course, we're in a pandemic. Uh, in terms of the discussion of a disenrollment, where do you think that we're at on a larger scale of what that means for tribal nations? Um, again, you know, these are difficult issues. One of the most cherished uh, federal policies that we have is the independence of tribal government and a big part of that, as it is for any sovereign, is determining for itself who its citizens are, who are going to be the, the members who get to participate and be protected by that government. And so, you know, on one hand, we often use that sort of as a shield to protect us from state government, from federal government, et cetera. And we really cherish that independence. Sometimes it becomes a sword. In this case, you know, uh, looking internally, you know, this tribal government exercising its, its you know, independent ability to determine membership is making cuts to that membership. And so, uh, again, on the policy side, you know, that, that's a little separate. Um, you mix in the, the cultural side of it. You know, it, it, it sometimes seems hard to accept that, uh, that you're going to exclude people who have been longtime members of your community. And, uh, you know, my hope would be that there would be some type of, of ability for, you know, the United States to, to kind of broker some things. Um, sometimes the United States has been successful. When I say the United States, usually the Department of Interior has been successful at brokering, you know, an arrangement, um, and sometimes not. Um, my hope in this case would be that um, it is difficult to see these things happen, like over Christmas and during, you know, the winter, bad weather, et cetera. And so, um, you know, hopefully the United States certainly could step in and help some of these people during this time in the short term. Well, John, thank you so much. Thank you. On Sunday, many eyes will be on Super Bowl 56. But there is a history worth remembering about how Indigenous people contributed to the game of football. ICT's Caitlin Onawa Boysell looks back on this American sport. At the turn of the 20th century, the leading football team came from the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. It was the first boarding school run by the U.S. government. Assimilating into a white Christian culture was the goal, and young Native children were forced to leave their families to attend this boarding school. They were forbidden to speak their languages or practice their religions. When they arrived at Carlisle, their heads were shaved, their clothes were burned in front of them, and they were put in front of a blackboard with names written in chalk on the blackboards. And they couldn't read the names, but they were instructed to point to a name, and then that was their name. The conditions were crude. They were fed a poor diet, and the dorms were overcrowded, making it easy for disease to spread quickly, killing young children. Thorpe came to Carlisle when he was 16 years old. Still, it was at this school and under these horrific conditions that a powerhouse football team was born. And by 1907, they were considered one of the most dynamic football teams. 
The players came from several different tribes. Frank Mount Pleasant is recognized with inventing the spiral pass. He was from the Tuscarora Nation. The team also pioneered the overhand spiral and other trick plays that frustrated their opponents, as documented by the school and in media reports. Elmer Bush was from the Pomo tribe and he was inducted into the American Indian Hall of Fame in 1973. They both played with Thorpe at Carlisle. Jim Thorpe is considered one of the greatest athletes of all time. He inspired future indigenous football players like my grandfather, Glenn Condren. Jim Thorpe was a Native American, was a superhero. I mean, and he was a super athlete and he played I guess every sport there was, and he did well at every one of them. So. Thorpe was an outstanding runner. He earned a spot on the U.S. track team and went to the 1912 Olympics. There, he easily won both the pentathlon and decathlon. Later, he was accused of playing for money because he joined the New York Giants baseball club. His gold medals were taken away by the Olympic Committee and later returned. Today, he is listed as a co-champion. But some say that isn't enough means so much to Indian country to restore these honors. So uh, the letter was sent to the president of the IOC saying, we'd like to work this out, work with you. We've started the petition. You know, uh, we are very interested in getting this done. And um, we actually never heard back from him. Um, he had one of his librarians send us a letter and um, which had some actual factual information that was incorrect. So Still, to this day, his family fights for his recognition in the Olympics. After high school, Thorpe joined the first indigenous national football team called the Oorang Indians. The team was based in LaRue, Ohio. Walter Lingo started the team in 1922, and at that time, the NFL franchise fee was just $100 a year. The team wasn't the best. They only won three games in two years of playing. Lingo focused a lot of his team's efforts on halftime shows to entertain the crowd and advertise for his business. He owned a dog kennel and trained the dogs to perform tricks with the players. Still, Thorpe was a part of many firsts in football, including becoming the first president of the American Professional Football Association, known today as the NFL. None of this history is taught in America's public schools, not the history of government running boarding schools, and not the history of how the football players influence the game. And you kind of see the erasure of American history and Native Americans, not just in football. You can't say we should try to see it in all of American history. Um, so I'm glad, you know, we're, we're kind of retelling this. Because of his influence on the game, Thorpe was inducted into the Professional Football Hall of Fame, inspiring other NFL players like Jim Warren. Warren had an outstanding college career at Arizona State University. In 1987, he was on the team that won the Rose Bowl. He went on to play for the Cincinnati Bengals and the Detroit Lions and Tampa Bay, inspired by the legacy of Jim Thorpe. It was still influential to me to see a Native person as the greatest athlete in the world. After Warren retired from the NFL, he went into the film industry and used his voice to raise the issue of misrepresentation of Natives in football. A film he produced about the use of Native mascots premiered on the Fox Network on Thanksgiving in 2020. I never did play for a team with a native mascot, but I played against teams with native mascots. So obviously I was a target of people that wanted to say things like scalp the Indian or cut your hair. When you and then of course, when George Preston Marshall took over the football team in Washington, dropping the name on there that became so offensive that we recently saw changed because of economic pressure, uh, not so much because of a battle of conscience, um, it's really opened up some eyes to help people try to rediscover um, the Native American impact on football, on this country. Other notable players include Sam Bradford, who is from the Cherokee Nation and a Heisman Trophy winner. Also wide receiver that plays for the LA Chargers, Keenan Allen, who is Lumbee. And starting quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys, Dak Prescott, who is Choctaw and Apache. And more than 60 Pacific Islanders have been a part of the NFL, according to the Pacific Islanders Football Hall of Fame. And they all have this one thing in common. You're only as good as your last play, I mean, and you you never know when the la your last play is either. 
Behind the scenes, there's one man who's looking to groom the next generation of Indigenous professional players. For 13 years, Robert Judkins has led the live production of NFL games. His job is to make sure viewers can watch their favorite team with no interruptions. He saw a need for training and held his first football camp in Southern California on the land of the Saboba Band of Luceno Indians. 100 kids turned out as well as some professional football players. Um, there are a lot of Native kids, especially in the high school ranks, that don't get exposure. Um, some great talent that's out there. I mean, definitely D1 uh, prospects that are out there. And so I think there's a need for uh, exposure and to get kids at a younger age exposed to the game of football and just exposed to sports in general. From future D1 prospects to being considered one of the greatest athletes of all time, indigenous people have led the effort in football, but will there ever be another Jim Thorpe? I'm trying to think of athletes who try to do more than one sport. And I just don't think our society is structured in that capacity. I think if someone shows a great deal of skill, it's not to say it can't happen, but I think it's very unlikely. It's been more than 109 years since Jim Thorpe and his teammates came up with trick plays that you still see today. So the next time you watch football, think about the Carlisle Indians and Jim Thorpe and how they shaped the game. Kaylin Anwa Boisel, Indian Country Today. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. Thank you for watching. For the latest news, visit IndianCountryToday.com. I am Aaliyah Chavez. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run, you got to run.